Thank you very much. And um, can I add to Catherine's thanks for the very warm, warm welcome um, and being with you to talk about this very important um, subject at this important time for all of us. And I'm going to pick up on some of the things that Catherine said, um, particularly around business, because if we are to arrive at the fairer and healthier economy, which does have well-being at its heart, we really do need to consider the role of business in achieving that. And while business doesn't have a vote, we all know that it's hugely influential and can be a power for good. And I'm increasingly aware that some younger people are now looking to larger businesses to step into what they perceive as government failure to tackle today and tomorrow's key issues and global inequalities. And after all, while businesses are inanimate, they are led by people. And I would argue that one way for us to reach our destination by building back better is to persuade more businesses and their leaders to become what I call business with purpose. So, so what do I mean by that? In um, speaking to Catherine to prepare for this morning, I, um, she helped me to realize that I'd actually been thinking about this for almost four decades. Um, in the early 1980s, I started as an article clerk in a city of London law firm. And uh, at that time you spent six months in four departments, as you do now. And my second six months, I started work in what was called the Eurobond department. Eurobonds were then some 20 years old, but it was an entirely new concept for me. And I spent six months completely and utterly bamboozled as to what these things were and, and their purpose. And I basically learned that they were instruments making money out of money. And it was the first time I encountered what I now describe somewhat clumsily as the financialization of business. The increasing disconnect between the owners of businesses, mainly shareholders, and their employees, supply chains, customers, communities, whether geographic or communities of interest. And in my working life as a lawyer, I saw the exponential growth of private equity uh, owners of businesses, where literally every three to five years, I would be involved in selling a business to another private equity owner who was going to work it very hard for three years to earn profit, irrespective of the impact on their community. We've seen the rise of short termism in business. It's been even more exacerbated by the increased use in share trading of algorithms which trade in listed shares in milliseconds on the basis of a predetermined mathematical formula, irrespective of the underlying value of the business. And if I'm honest, this is one of the reasons why um, 15 years ago, I decided to leave the law when I did. I now find that people who are far more clever than I am um, have been writing about this and a book I read recently by um, Colin Mayers of the Science Business um, School at Oxford University called um, Prosperity really summed it up quite well for me and that his premise is that it's only over the past 50 years that we've begun to witness what he describes as the retreat of multi-purposed, publicly orientated businesses who have instead become single focused self interested entities and that they've while sort of elevating shareholders interests above those of employees and communities and the environment may have made sense when financial capital was scarce he argues that now finance is abundant but human natural and social capital are all in short supply and an ever decreasing supply potentially and that the successful business of the future will concentrate on producing profitable solutions to the problems of people and the planet. So profit, in other words, flows from the pursuit of a broader social purpose. And it seems that lots of us as consumers agree with that. There was a recent global survey 
where 94% of those who were surveyed said that it's really important that the companies they engage with have a strong purpose. And some thought companies should only earn a profit if they also can demonstrate they're delivering a positive impact. But they also thought that the vast majority of companies don't have a clear and strong purpose. So is it possible to create this change, which I think needs to be shared and agreed by business leaders, investors, employers, consumers, and we as citizens? I think there does seem to be a groundswell in this, and I hope this is something that will be accelerated as a result of the pandemic. And we are beginning to see change in some of the, what I call the mega corporates, those sort of global corporate titans that straddle the world. And the, the US Business Roundtable, which is a sort of union of some of those companies headquartered in the States, they've recently issued a statement saying that shareholders should no longer be the sole and primary concern of boards of companies. And um, while Davos didn't take place this year, they did publish their manifesto and it has similar sentiments. Um, Last year, the um, Paul, uh, Paul Pullman, who uh, was the outgoing um, chief exec of Unilever, and perhaps he was brave enough to say it because he was the outgoing chief exec, posed the question, which I do think does business now needs to answer, which is why should citizens of the world keep companies around whose sole purpose is the enrichment of a few people? And Larry Fink, who's chief executive Black, of BlackRock, they're one of the world's largest um, leading investment banks. They've got over six trillion dollars of assets under management. And, and he writes a, an annual letter to the chief execs of all of the companies that they invest in. And in the letter he published very early last year, he said, you know, he, he said that as governments are failing to prepare for the future, um, but people were looking to companies to not only deliver financial performance, but a positive contribution to society, benefiting customers and communities, as well as shareholders. And he argued that without a social purpose, companies fail to make the investments in employees, innovation and capital, which is needed for long term growth. Although, of course, there was an ironic note of self-interest in all of this because he said that if companies did that, it would result in above average returns to the likes of, of BlackRock. And, you know, but there are examples of companies around the world that adopt that approach. And one that I'm familiar with is Spain's Mondragon, which is based in the Basque country. It's been going for about 60 years. Um, and it's a conglomerate um, with over about 250 different business units and it spans finance, retail, manufacturing, green energy. And they've got about 80,000 employees. And all of the um, decisions about what that business should do and its ownership is, is with its employees, which I think is an absolutely fantastic thing. And the highest paid employee Mondragon earns no more than eight times the lowest paid person there. So it proves it can be done and they turn over 12 billion euros a year, I think. So it's a very sizable entity. Fiona, can, and, I uh, you, can I just give you a two minute warning? Thank you. Of course, of course. So, so there are examples there. I wondered as well what's happening in, in, in Scotland. And I think we are beginning to make good progress in Scotland because we have the Scottish Business Pledge. For those of you who are not familiar with it, this is something that businesses can sign up to. There are 10 pledges, everything from uh, making sure we're paying the living wage, that we've got an environmental mitigation strategy, prompt payment for um, suppliers, no inappropriate use of zero hours contract, contracts. But having checked yesterday, we've only got 744 businesses signed up today and we need more. Another thing I believe passionately in is employee participation and ownership. Um, and you know, we've got good examples again in Scotland, of course led the way by Tullis Russell, 
but at Edgington Group, um, which makes the Macallan and famous grouse, 25% of that is owned by current and past employees and 70% by the trust I chair, the Robertson Trust. And we've now got 100 employee owned companies in Scotland, which is great. So we've got some shoots to build on, but I do hope too that we'll learn from lockdown and some of the great innovations around new ways of working, flexibility will be taken and carried forward to ensure that each and every one of us has a fairer share in a healthy economy.